he was easily one of the quirkiest, most irreverent people that you've ever met. One of the best characters that football's ever had. Nobody can appreciate the number of lives he's affected. You know, he was a genius. Uh, I mean, he was he was a ma he was a mad genius, but he, but he was a genius nevertheless. You can't do what Mike Leach did to our son and get away with it. Not in the United States of America. Why not the coach? The controversy. Mike Leach is Mike Leach. Mike, Mike. Fighting Frenchman in this. Hey, you know I got a team. No, I got a team. I hope my email finds you well in these strange times. To many, Mike Leach is the single most legendary college football coach of all time. Even though he's 60th on the list of all-time wins and doesn't have any national championships. Tracked a raccoon one time in the snow. Some of the biggest pricks on earth, they work in a student loan collection. First of all, what kind of mythical powers does a sun devil have? We've got to consider that. He's the person that makes college football fun. He's a one-off. You could travel far and wide and you couldn't possibly find anyone even remotely like him, which is one of the most compelling things about him. Mike was completely unafraid to be himself. A lot of people may use that term a little loosely. He's his own man or he's one of a kind. That's Mike. Yeah, he's one of a kind and he was his own man, period. And if you don't like the way he does it, he doesn't care. There was a confidence that came with just like being around Coach Leach. You never really felt like an underdog with him. Part confidence, part just really not giving a fuck what people thought. You know, like, but it was awesome, man. It was contagious. He liked to kind of play coy and, and say things that made you think, what the heck is this guy doing? What, what's he saying? Meanwhile, he's the smartest guy in the room. Just, just an independent thinker. Leach is fascinated by the world around him, but indifferent to how the world sees him. He's disheveled, tends to mumble, and talks in circles that only add to his mystery. You know, she was an heiress to a big corporation, and so I'm not sure that that didn't bother him a little more than than the breakup itself. I've always got an on-deck circle of books to read, which uh, <clears throat> it, it gets harder and harder to read them, because, you know, nowadays there's an awful lot of good stuff on TV, like crazy good stuff, mm -hmm. like... Uh, well, the Hemingway thing's on right now. Uh, uh, PBS has a three-part deal on Ernest Hemingway, which, uh, you know, that's required viewing. He, would, he was a great student of history. In fact, he taught a class at, at Washington State. Uh, they, he was concerned they'd, they'd get 100 people that would sign up for it. They ended up getting 50,000 requests. He's wrote about Geronimo. Uh, he's wrote about football. Uh, he's talked about, you know, chasing raccoons. How does it, I don't know how he knows this stuff. Uh, you know, I was in a, a neighborhood and I was just curious where this raccoon lived, you know. And, you know, there's fresh raccoon tracks uh, and he'd been digging in somebody's garbage. So I, I, I followed the tracks and I don't even know if these people know it, but he lives right in the back of their house in a bunch of brush and trees, you know. As somebody said, it's like tapping a balloon, you know, it, 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 talking to him, it, it, he drifts. Whatever you say, he'll drift into another subject. He, he seemed sometimes bored talking about college football whenever we would interview him. You just didn't know where it was going to go. In recruiting, he didn't talk about any football. You know, I remember when I met with him and all we did was magic tricks. He did a, like a card trick and then a phone trick. And then he's like, well, looks like you're ready to play football here. And I'm like, well, we haven't talked about football, so. It should come as no major surprise that Coach Leach takes a somewhat unconventional method of transportation to work every day. He walks from his home here in Pullman to his office on campus, nearly four miles both directions. The best way is to go straight over this field. What is this? Are these garbanzo? These are, yeah, you can eat them if you want. These do, you, do you know who owns kind of this land? Are they okay with you? Yeah, yeah, he's a good fella. You always got coach, you know. Um, wasn't watered down. Definitely wasn't politically correct. Um, As coaches, we failed uh, to make our coaching points and our points more compelling than their fat little girlfriends. Now, their fat little girlfriends have some obvious advantages. For one thing, their fat little girlfriends are telling them what they want to hear, which is how great you are and how, uh, how easy it's going to be. I mean, that defies every level of... Uh, work ethic that exists with regard to football. I just always marveled the leader he was and even though he was a little <laughs> bit he wasn't your your conventional type but he was a leader and he was demanding and he's a hell of a football coach. The biggest thing I want you to take away from this game is nothing is really 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 fun unless it's hard. Okay nothing is really fun unless it's hard and we've got to embrace that things are going to be hard we got to embrace, be excited 
when things are hard because then, and you guys will remember this game the rest of your life. And now there's plenty of games you'll forget, but you'll remember this one the rest of your life. Texas. Imagine your favorite team bracing for the biggest showdown in school history against a hated in-state rival just after sundown. The Red Raider Nation has never been larger. There are a lot of people at Texas I like, but this isn't the time for that. I mean, I, uh, I, mean, I, I deeply hope we beat their ass today. <laughs> point away from coming back in dramatic fashion. If you were to forgive me for this, about to lose to the number one team in the nation, what's Leach's demeanor in that moment when he's sending you back out there? He just turned to me and he said, all right, let's go score, pretty much in that tone. Pretty good advice in exactly, that, in yeah. that, in that what position. What else are you going to say, you know? Wall's going to take it out straight up the field to 15, 20, 25. Oh, maybe not. 30, 35, and out of bounds at the 37. Harold, ready to go. He's got the football. Pressure coming. Throws it short, and it's caught. One, low snap. Harold's got it. Back to throw time. Throws left sideline. It's caught. So Harold in the shotgun from the 28. Lincoln Riley shared with me a story about the great Texas Tech team in 2008. Middle of the season, one practice, Mike decides that they haven't been throwing the go ball very well. And so he decides that in that practice, that's all they're going to do. And the quarterbacks obviously are going to throw go routes all day, but the wide receivers are going to run go routes all day long. Well, these wide receivers end up running go routes all day to the tune of probably, Lincoln said, three, four miles of go routes. You know, that, that's all they're doing. And and some of the other coaches started getting uh, worried about like the, the number of go routes that they were running and, and the, the freshness of the wide receivers and their legs. And some of them said to Mike, we can't do this. And Mike said, why not? Do you remember what the situation was? Texas is number one in the country. Both of these teams are 8-0. It's early November. There is no time left on the clock. It's 33-32 Texas until it was. Eight seconds. Do you know what route was called on that iconic play against Texas? That was all go. That was four verticals. It was go routes. Last one standing, you were the throw goes to the right side for Crabtree. It's caught. Nice. He's oh, 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 and the Red Raiders, led by Mike Leach, walk it off. Stunned silence on the Longhorn sideline. We don't have a 12 team playoff here. Texas was out. That was it. Colt McCoy looks devastated because he is. And it didn't matter what coverage Texas was going to run. Graham Harrell and Michael Crabtree knew because of days like the only go route day in practice that they could execute it. And it was because of Mike Leach and his his willingness and his fortitude to just say, why not? Why not? One sports writer called you a football madman directing a sideshow. Mm, yeah, well, I don't know. I mean... Uh... Uh, I, I, I don't have any disagreement with it, really. You are one of only six head coaches in college football who didn't play in college football, and you also have degrees that uh, surpass many of the head coaches. So what does it feel like being a nerd? You know, it works out all right because I've got more experience with that, to be perfectly honest, than, than I do being one of the cool kids. He's known as a football intellectual, but his eyes really light up when he talks about the simple, brutal collision of the offensive and defensive line. 
you know, when O-line, D-line go one-on-one -on -one and, you know, just get incredibly violent. I mean, that's what it's all about. I mean, you get to see those guys just go to war, you know, and and, uh, and it's got all the things that football entails. There's shouting, there's there's blood, there's boogers, there's a whole thing. I mean, and there's, there's, there's spitting, there's fighting, there's ripped jerseys, there's uh, somebody grabbing somebody's throat. I mean, it's why you have football. Otherwise, it's just some form of uh, basketball or soccer, which there's nothing wrong with those things, but they're still not football. Mike Leach got bitten by the coaching bug at a fairly young age. He was only 15 years old when he was head coach of a Little League baseball team. You know, I was fairly consumed with, you know, the moving parts and being the best baseball coach that I could. You know, I looked out there and I thought, well, you know, I can do that. I can do that better than these guys. It sounds insignificant, but it certainly it certainly wasn't to me. And it's, and it's why I'm uh, coaching college football right now, because I never really got that out of my system. But he wasn't always set on a path into professional coaching. He went off to college at BYU and then immediately on to Pepperdine for law school. What kind of lawyer did you think you were going to be? Uh, I wanted to do, at the end, I wanted to do like products liability. As in, uh, you know, if that camera explodes all over that guy, we'd sue the camera company and their insurance company, you see. But for all intensive purposes, he just really couldn't shake this call to coaching. He was worried it would be increasingly difficult to turn back to try coaching if he went ahead and started practicing law. I went through this thing in law school where I'm thinking, okay, do I have a great law practice, coach in my spare time, or coach when I retire? I mean, I knew that that wasn't going to quite cut it because, you know, spare time, I knew that there in times there wouldn't be spare time. So he decided to never start practicing law in the first place. And so I figured, well, I'm going to coach for, you know, two years, three at the most, get it out of my system, then go practice law. Mm -hmm. And so that was more appealing, except for when I graduated from uh, law school and we informed uh, uh, my parents and um, my wife's parents that I was going to go pursue coaching for a while. How'd that go After over? they decided, realized that was, I wasn't joking. <laughs> Oh, no, they were pissed. I mean, I mean, now three of them were pissed except my dad. He just walked off laughing, shaking his head. So instead of taking a high salary job as an attorney, he went back to school, racked up even more student debt, and got a master's in coaching. Would I spend a week in jail to get rid of my student loans? I would have spent three months in jail to get rid of my student loans, and I would have done it happily. And eventually, before it was all said and done, I'd be leaving. I'd be leaving, leading prison calisthenics and stuff like that. Uh, I, I mean, I, I would have been. I would have been like that uh, leprechaun on the damn Lucky Charms if they said, "Okay, one week, all your student loans are erased." In his first few years coaching, he'd only make like ten thousand dollars a year, but it was what he felt more called to do. So he began gathering experience in assistant coaching roles, and after a few years, he landed a job as offensive coordinator under head coach Hal Mummy at an NAIA school, Iowa Wesleyan. Well, I was the recruiting coordinator, I was the video guy, I was the equipment guy, I was the offensive coordinator, I was the offensive line coach, and I was the sports information director. I hired Mike in 1989 when I got that job, mainly because nobody else wanted it. Iowa Wesleyan had been winless the year before in 1988, so when Leach and Mummy got in there, they knew they had work to do. And basically, they got to work on reinventing football offense itself. We, we had driven around all these places in a 1984 Ford Taurus, trying to find all these ideas to put into our offense, put into what we were doing. And together, we constantly devise, think about, tinker, copy. How do we want to move the ball? What do we want our offense to be like? Because at the time, you know, there, there was really only one or two ways that that would be accepted to move the ball down the field. We would go anywhere and everywhere and study uh, what other people were doing. I mean, we'd drive to a high school if they had some neat little play or something like that. We'd drive up to the Green Bay Packers. We would drive to any college under the sun and, and, uh, and blizzards uh, as we're driving across Iowa. And in the course of that, I was fortunate to develop uh, a pretty good knowledge base and certainly a diverse one. Philosophy-wise, we want to maximize space. We want to attack the entire field. How do you build an offense that attacks via the air but is not totally uh, reliant on just a great wide receiver and you can have four or five guys produce? 
and they built the air raid offense. It's funny, if you look at the way he runs his offense, it looks a little bit more like a basketball offense than a football offense. It's all about spacing. It's all about stretching the defense out. Even his line is stretched all the way across the field. Sometimes it's hard to tell they're an offensive line. There's so much space in between them. When we were in Iowa Wesleyan for three years, won a bunch of games, went to Valdosta State for five years, won a bunch of games, and then <clears throat> From there is one of the biggest leaps in the history of college football. Uh, Hal got hired to be the head coach at uh, University of Kentucky. Went from uh, Valdosta State to the University of Kentucky. How about that? Walked into his office, introduced myself to him, and the first thing he said to me was, Two things. You're the starter, and we're going to throw it 50 times a game. Greatest time of possession in the world's a touchdown. The beauty of Mike's offense and, and how mummy the two of them designed this is they're going to do what they can do, period. It's better than you can defend it. It's a high-speed aerial assault. Most teams run 70 plays in a game. Tech will run 90. I don't know if I'd risk dropping back and throwing it. But he's going to. Minshew here, and they're taking a shot, and it's caught by Patman, first down. He was like, I don't call run plays. And I was like, whoa, wait, wait, wait. you what? And he says, I don't call run plays. He, he said, every time we hand the ball off, that's the quarterback checking to a run. And I and I stopped and I, and I was like, hold on a second. You mean to tell me you do not call run plays? And he said, absolutely not. It's as if when he walks into a football program and grabs the quarterback, he, sp he sprinkles fairy dust on him because the quarterback becomes a different human being. When I called Mike Leach to tell him that I was going to decommit from Texas Tech uh, and that I was going to be going to Alabama, he, he responded quickly like he can do. <laughs> that he's so quick-witted, he responded by saying, Oh, that'll be good. You'll, you'll throw five times a game. And he said, well, we're going to at least know that we're going to throw it more on the first drive than you will in the game. And I was like, so you, do you care about balance at all? And he started howling, balance. He's like, I can call for balance or I can call for production. One of the two. What do you want? We're going to throw it. That's how we run our offense, and it's your job to stop it. And, and the thing that stood out to me in this day and age where you see the Sean Paytons that have the the Denny's menu of plays and all this. Mike Leach had the one little thing that fit in the palm of his hand. The biggest problem hasn't been having enough plays. It's been having too many, not making up your mind on um, what you were going to do and, and um, you know, what was what you were going to hang your hat on offensively. We were really the only team that said, you know what, we're not going to need it at all. We're going to throw it 50, 60 times. It was an exciting brand of football to watch. I felt like he was having fun when he was coaching. And you can't say that for a lot of good coaches. Like, I don't think Nick Saban has fun. I right. don't think Kirby Smart is having fun. Mike Leach had fun. One of the most fun stories from Leach's on-field career came in 1999 when he was the offensive coordinator at Oklahoma. So in this 1999 game against Texas, Mike Leach came up with the idea to create a decoy call sheet just trying to get any little advantage they could maybe the craziest thing about it is that it actually worked at least to start out we wanted to just see how honest texas was so we decided to write up a script a dummy script so he he had up drawn up the uh, you know ou game plan you know texas and he had the first 15 20 plays that we're, we're gonna call. The challenge wasn't just to create random plays to throw them off. He wanted to create complimentary plays to get the defense the most out of position as possible. And you know, one's a, one's a reverse and it wasn't a reverse, or one's this and it wasn't that. And the other challenge was finding a way to have Texas discover it so that they thought it was real. So he had one of his players pretend to accidentally drop it. And he gave it to, I guess, it, to Trent Smith our tight end and, and he had Trent run by like he was tucking it in his belt and intentionally let it slip out and fall on the ground. He's like, I want you to run past their sideline and as you're running up the tunnel, I want you to take the script and act like you're putting it in your belt loop and let it fall out onto the ground. 
It was kind of the first real like uh, espionage I'd ever been a, a part of. And somebody else was baiting, uh, was over there watching to see if any of them picked it up. One of their GAs is wandering by and, oh, what's this? A piece of paper. He looks at it and his eyes get kind of big and he sort of hides it and looks around to see if anybody saw him get it. And sure enough, one of the Texas personnel, grad assistant or manager, whoever, picks it up and looks at it, looks around like, is anyone looking at me? And then he scurried up up to their locker room with the, with the fake sheet. We all thought it was real because we thought that the alternative would, would be just so far-fetched uh, that, that somebody would go through the trouble to create a fake call sheet and actually leave it and drop it, you know, where we would find it. And I didn't know this was happening. They, they, I found out about it like at the end of the next week. And I'm like, you gotta be kidding me. You guys did what? <laughs> Paul Reese takes it up to the press box. He starts studying the script, trying to figure out what defense they're gonna call to match up the script. And on the second play of the game, the script says double reverse pass. We were trying to get them over there to the left. We hit Savage and everybody was over to the left and Savage was to the right. It's very hard in the course of a football game to go back and see a wide receiver at any level of football that wide open. We came out and I mean, we go up first quarter, we're up 17 nothing. But eventually Texas caught on and ended up winning 38 to 28. No, that was, that was Mike to a T. Don't ever try to pick up my scripts or steal my signals because you don't know what may be in store for you. But trickery aside, Leach's offense at Oklahoma was just producing and he was getting noticed for head coaching positions. I told him, literally, I said, you come here two, three, four years, we do well, you'll have a head coaching job. It took nine months, one year. One year. Yeah. So, uh, and then he did a great job at Texas Tech. And we An unbelievable pick. job. He wasn't coaching Blue Bloods. He was coaching teams that no one else wanted to coach, and he made them really, really good. When you're a superstar high school football player in that region, you don't think, oh, I'm going to go to Texas Tech. You go to Texas Tech after Texas and Oklahoma and Nebraska and even Texas A&M have, 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 have passed on you and not offered you a scholarship. So uh, this coach was taking athletes that had been kind of the rejects of the big schools and using them to beat the big schools. In the last four years, they almost lead the conference in victories with a class that has been, on average, those recruiting classes and then towards the bottom of the class. The real genius of Leach as a leader isn't necessarily the scheme or the strategy, it's the institution that he's built here, the repetition. You know, Bear Bryant always said, don't hire anybody unless he knows something that uh, you don't, because if he doesn't know something you don't, you don't need him. Bringing on good coaches and delegating to them, you know, choosing a small playbook that they wrap rather than a big playbook and they try to out-scheme people. There's just really a lot of good management lessons in terms of how he approaches things. You know, think about he was at Texas Tech in the Big 12, and he averaged over eight wins a year in Lubbock, which is tough right. to do. And then at Washington State, in eight seasons at Washington State, he had 55 wins. In the eight seasons prior, Washington State had 29 wins. He doubled it, and then he also has the only 11-win team in Washington State history in 2018. Not only did he like take those schools and turn them around, but he actually changed the entire sport of football. If you look at a Big 12 football game now uh, versus 10 years ago, it's a completely different event. It's because everybody's watching Mike Leach's offense. You look around, Lincoln Riley has produced three of the last six Heisman winners. But you, what you don't see is the trickle down effect that he's had where we go watch a high school team play and the elements of his offensive system are pervasive. When he went to Tech, it spread all through the high schools out, out, throughout Texas, uh, that offense did. And now it's even infiltrated up into the NFL. He's one of those guys where you're going to, you're going to be, you, you'll remember what he brought to this game forever. You will. But you know, I miss everywhere that I've been to or coached at for different reasons. The biggest thing generally is the people, because people are pretty good people. Uh, people everywhere. I mean, well, I guess in, in Lubbock there were four bad apples that were determined to cheat me out of my salary. I mean, we know about that. But uh, and the other four years on my contract, and and then continue to uh, to hide uh, the documents illegally. But uh, short of that, I mean, I thought everybody was great. Texas Tech has fired football coach Mike Leach. 
The school handed Leach's attorney, Ted Liggett, a termination letter Wednesday. The letter says Leach is, quote, terminated with cause, effective immediately. All we want is answers. We know Coach Leach isn't coming back, but we want answers to why it happened the way it did, what really happened behind the closed doors. Gerald Myers, Kent Hance, Guy Bailey, we're right on your doorstep. I am a proud alumni, although I've thought about walking in Kent Hance's office and burning my diploma, but that would probably set off the fire alarm, so I better not do that. You can't do what Mike Leach did to our son and get away with it. Not in the United States of America. Craig James would like to see me uh, screw over some kid that doesn't have a mom or a dad or something like that to play his son because he's rich and he's got influence and he thinks he can push people around because he's on ESPN and all things ridiculous. Mike, I want to start with uh, your uh, your description of the attitude of Adam James while he was a player for you. Oh, uh, lazy! I think he. Well, the, the biggest thing is, is I think he's lazy. I think that uh, there's a sense of entitlement. You know, really, a guy that we could never get to work hard and uh, wanted to fall back uh, on his father anytime uh, he wasn't playing, and so. Uh, you know, you had Craig meddling in things all the time. Anybody who thinks that we asked to go through this, think again. This is not what we were hoping for at all with Adam's career at Texas Tech. You said that Craig James was meddling. How do you define meddling? Well, I would say when you when you call uh, coaches, uh, when you call me, you call uh, his position coaches, both of them. Uh, you call other administrators on campus. You were portrayed today on Outside the Lines as a helicopter dad meaning that you're always hovering around. These were the words from the attorney from Mike Leach, and also that your son was a disgruntled player, not getting enough playing time. What would be your reaction to those statements? It is absolutely not true. Craig James required more time than all of the other parents combined. We didn't ask to go through this, I promise you. And the funny thing is, he used to call me from different numbers, so it got to where I recognized his number, you know, because he thinks his son's going to the NFL which of course is ridiculous. This is all about Adam sustaining a concussion and the actions that took place against Adam after the con after concussion was diagnosed. Has nothing to do with any of those other things. That is has nothing to do with what we're doing here. Uh, he came out on the field, he was not uh, dressed in school gear like the other players and everybody else involved. Uh, had a hat on backwards, had his sunglasses on. And I, I said, why does he have sunglasses on? They said, well, he's sensitive to light because he had a concussion. I said, well, put him somewhere out of the light. Leach was suspended by the university on Monday while the school investigated allegations that he mistreated an injured player. Receiver Adam James alleges Leach twice confined him to small dark spaces, including this equipment shed during practices after the player was diagnosed with a concussion. So then he went to a garage that's got the door open. At no point was, was the garage locked. It holds uh, two vehicles. It's got an ice machine. It's got a fan. And uh, while we're on the subject, the offensive line during um, special teams We'll go to the shed, especially on a hot day because it's shady, and, and second of all, because there's an ice machine there. Uh, it's, it's none of this stuff that's been portrayed None of this cool hand Luke uh, Brubaker stuff that uh, is so popular to sensationalize. And, and quite, quite honestly, I think there's been some irresponsible journalism on that because there's been an overwhelming amount of evidence to the contrary. I mean, with regard to Adam, the entire thing's about playing time. I have a, uh, I, I have a statement by uh, Dr. Michael Fye, who's the, uh, who's the doctor that treated Adam James and diagnosed him with a concussion. And the most important line on this statement says, according to the information given to me, no additional risks or harm were imposed on Adam by what he was asked to do. Uh, someone said, well, it didn't hurt the kid. Well, you know, that's not the question. Uh, do we have to wait and take action after someone is hurt? 
Uh, do we have to wait until a kid is uh, injured or, or dead or something like that before we take action? How many people need to get hurt before we learn a valuable lesson? One, two, three, four. Dwight. No, no, hear me out. Five, six. Dwight. Seven. Can I finish, please? Okay. Eight? Craig, without getting into specifics, you know, there's a lot of arguments how big the room was, air conditioned, dark, etc. From everything you have heard in all your years in football, in college, in the NFL, have you heard of teammates or other players in any other leagues being treated in a, in a similar fashion? Steve, it's, uh, it's unheard of. It's a very serious matter, uh, and they are continuing their uh, investigation into the situation. What pressure? did you find that Mike Leach had put on trainers and or players to return to the practice field or to games when they've been injured? Well, I'm not at liberty to go into that at this time. And, uh, we'll, you know, that will, uh, that will be an issue that will, uh, come out later. They talk about, uh, they had some investigation or something. They never had an investigation. Uh, they lied about having an investigation. Then they won't produce the documents to prove they had an investigation. Let's go ahead and see it. And, and of course, it's going to illustrate they lied to the fans and everybody else. Well, it just goes to show you how Kent Hans and some of his little cronies, how sleazy those guys are. Why do you think well, they uh, fired you, Mike? I honestly don't know. I think it's, uh, probably has something to do with power and control. And I'll tell you the other thing I think it has to do with is I just don't, I think they don't want to pay the money. Do you think this book and lawsuits are hurting your chances of getting a head coaching job? Well, it's had a chilling effect. I mean, they smeared me for, you know, the better part of a year. And so this is an opportunity to set the record straight. I mean, on one hand I get, well, uh, if you upset ESPN, well, ESPN threw out a bunch of lies about me uh, for a period of time, and so I definitely have an interest in setting the record straight. And the, the crazy thing is we haven't heard from Craig James since, basically. Well, he I mean, ran, he yeah. ran for senator, yeah, and then he got right. smoked. Oh, I, I've got support all over the place. I have a lot of friends out here, and, uh, and, and I've been out here several times. And so it's, you know, it's a fun place for me to come. Uh, there are a lot of good candidates in this race, and, and so we'll see how it shakes out on election day. Did you consider running against him for senator just so you could debate yeah, him on whether or not I, his son was Well, because I, I, I would have withdrawn after I had a couple debates because I'd love to debate <laughs> Craig James on any subject. I'd be fully prepared to debate Craig James on whether, the, you know, I, could t I would take the side that the earth is flat and he could take the side that it's round and I'm fully prepared to debate him on that. You can rest assured of this, that if I see wrong, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand up against it. I will never let something go by that is a bully or someone who's done something wrong. <laughs> well, the, fu the funny thing is in the Dallas Morning News, Dallas Morning News had this thing, and you know, I hadn't given any speeches. I wasn't running for senator, none of that. Who would you vote for for senator, Mike Leach or Craig James? I got 96% of the vote. so many amazing Mike Leach stories. I can only imagine how many you have in the vault, uh, but can you share a favorite story with us? I remember one time we were on safari in, in Tanzania and uh, and we had all gone to bed and, and kind of on these trips, a lot of times you had to to kind of keep track of Mike. I'd, I'd bring a friend or somebody that would, would, cause Mike's very intellectually curious. And sometimes he just kind of literally wanders off. So late that night in Tanzania, I got up and thought I should go check on, on Mike. And it was we in the hours of morning and he had stayed up all night uh, with a local Tanzanian bartender 
uh, trading stories. And Mike was very intellectually curious about people. And they had shared stories about his culture and his family. And Mike sharing stories about his culture and his family. And the, the, the fellow was very interested in cowboys. And Mike was very interested in, in what it was like to get married in Tanzania. And I remember that they developed that friendship. And after that, when we got home, Mike was adamant that I had to, to figure out, help him find out uh, where that fellow lived. And so he could mail him a cowboy hat. There was no facade, ego, or front. It was all just him, man. And that didn't matter who you were, who was around, what the setting was. The extreme authenticity in which he lived his life, man, he brings that out in others. And that's just so special. Conversations that would take crazy turns in a delightful way. And you'd always learn something. And you always felt like he was humble enough to feel like he could learn something from you. Uh, he was interested in your stories. He would ask lots of questions. And you always felt like he wasn't going through the motions. He actually wanted to know about you because as much as he knew, as wise as he was, he always felt like he could learn from other people. It didn't matter if you were a billionaire living next to him in Key West or a guy that he would see at Little Dewey's there in Starkville, Mississippi. He could find common ground with you. He could engage with you. And in some ways, you'd find yourself looking at the clock saying, Coach, I got to go <laughs> because he was so engaged and so willing to talk to anybody. And I failed to mention this at the beginning of the story. Bill Stevens, who was the SID at uh, Washington State, he he said at the time, Coach only has 15 minutes. Like, that's it. That's, like, that's, all, that's all we got today because it was busy. It was Thanksgiving week. And I thought, okay, yeah, that's fine. I'll take as much time as, as you're willing to give. We sat there for 45 minutes talking football. A couple of times I said, Coach, do you need to go? And he says, no, I love this. Um, I'll always remember that. So between that and just his pure stature, I mean, this is a college football legend who revolutionized the game of football on all levels. And so to just to have the time, that one time, and then to have developed this is something I'll forever be grateful for. As everyone knows, anyone who knew Mike, he had time for anyone and everyone. And he also had very little concept of time. Because if he gets like hooked on a story, we're gonna be 30 minutes late to practice. <laughs> like that happened multiple times. Like the whole team would be out on the field waiting for us to practice. And he'd be in there telling us about the best pizza place in Portland. All of us guys who knew him well, you knew if you picked up the phone when he's calling you at midnight or 12.30 in the morning, you're like, well, if I answer, I won't be on the phone till about two in the morning. Because there were no there were no short conversations with Mike, which was great. My last text from him was at 3 a.m. just saying, you're a stud. No context, nothing about it. And we'd talk for an hour and a half or two hours, and football would never come up. When you, well, you know, when you call and talk to ex-players, you're not talking about some touchdown somebody through occasionally you're talking about somebody getting smoked by a defender or something like that because it's funny to watch the expression on their face or to see them get laid out but you know usually what you talk about is you know the one time somebody said this and the other guy said that and then this guy tripped and then something fell on somebody or you know i mean or the dialogue or the stories i mean that, that, that that's what you end up talking about i mean for decades every coach the reason you saw the outpouring of, of uh, thoughts and, and concerns and prayers on social media is because even people that competed against him had a, a special place in their heart for him. You know, I think people look at why you coach. You, you know, you look and you say, hey, you coach because you like the fun and the competitiveness of Saturday. That's part of it. Uh, you coach because you, you like to think outside the box like Mike did to be an innovator. Really, a coach because you can make positive impact on young people's lives. People are drawn to you, and people are drawn to you not just to take pictures. They like hearing your take on things. They like hearing your advice, and it sure seems like you like to give it. You like people, and, and you like to say it like it is. It seems he went out of his way to, to care for people. To um, you know, if, if there was a, a person who was sick or going through a hard time, he would call them. 
Um, he would invite people out to practice and spend time with them if they were you know, down on their luck or going through a rough patch. He didn't believe those really overachievers. If you could achieve it, you know, that was your 100%. But he had a gift of getting you closer to that 100% um, than you ever thought was possible. And that's a hell of a gift. He was my philosophy teacher in terms of what it meant to be a man. You know, so often coaches do things only because they don't want to stand out from the crowd. Even if you are different, even if you see things differently, even if you have maybe a different approach to something that everyone seems to know, you don't have to necessarily do it that way. You can do it the way that works for you. Authenticity of self, freedom from fear and judgment, to always be there and make time for your friends. I'll take these lessons with me throughout the rest of my life. The way of living that I strive toward every day. He said, but there was something, there was a twinkle in this kid's eye. And he always made me believe that and feel that I was special and I could succeed. And man, like that means so much to me and I'll always be grateful for him for that. Let's take comfort in knowing Mike lived a big life and no too short, a full life and we were blessed enough to have shared in it with him. We miss the true originals uh, who make, makes sports and life interesting. Because he was totally unafraid to do things his He's way. He's not gonna bunt the ball down the field, you know, that's not his, not his way to do it. One of the most consistent men that I've ever met. He would not deviate from what he believed. He wanted to believe that anything was possible. He was going to live his life like Anything was possible. One of the truly irreplaceable things in the history of Nobody can appreciate the number of lives he's affected. One of the best characters that the world's ever had. Guys who played us all better, and it was better than we were with. So when you get an original offender like Mike Leach, they have a legacy that goes way beyond their own lifetime because of the ones they influence, the ones they encourage, and also in the rich. Why not? swinging yours like this I mean uh, you've got to find your inner pirate a lot of times things just happen for a reason we don't know why God wants it that way but you can't make the best out of it until you get back your inner pirate you might be the luckiest man alive and not even know it When people write the Mike Leach obituary, we, uh, that's many years from now, many, many years from now, how do you want to be remembered? Well, that's their problem. They're the one writing the obituary. I mean, what do I care? I'm dead. Hey, you know I got a team. No, I got a team. Ain't no getting in between. Hey, you know I got a team. You know I got a team. Yeah, yeah. Ain't no getting in between. Hey, you know I got a team. And we